The insanity defense is often a target of public scrutiny when it is used in high-profile cases where the crime is heinous. The public perceives its use as an attempt to escape consequences, in addition to raising concerns that dangerous people are not being incarcerated for their crimes. One of the most famous cases in Texas was that of Andrea Yates, who drowned her children in a bathtub. She was convicted at her first trial, which was later overturned on appeal. Her second trial resulted in a not guilty by reason of insanity verdict, which caused a great deal of controversy. Some argue that she should have been found guilty regardless of any real or perceived mental illness. When discussing insanity as a defense, it's first important to note that it is rarely raised as a defense, and when it is, it is not often successful. It is estimated the insanity defense is raised in less than 1% of all criminal cases nationwide. And of those 1% of cases, only 25% result in the person being found not guilty by reason of insanity. It's also important to note, insanity is not a medical definition. It is exclusively a legal definition. A doctor can't and won't diagnose you as insane. The insanity defense in Texas is among the most restrictive in the country. The Texas Penal Code states it is an affirmative defense at the time of conduct the actor, due to severe mental disease or defect, did not know their conduct was wrong. To appreciate how restrictive this is, think about it this way. If a person commits an offense, in order for a judge or jury to find them not guilty by reason of insanity, they must have absolutely zero understanding that their conduct was wrong due to mental disease or defect. In other words, their severe mental disease or defect must render them completely incapable of understanding their conduct was wrong. If that person has even one iota of understanding, or even one fraction of 1% of understanding at the time their conduct was wrong, then the judge or jury cannot find them guilty by reason of insanity. This is sometimes controversial in Texas because our insanity defense is sort of all or nothing. Critics argue that those who suffer only diminished understanding of their actions and not total lack of understanding are unjustly excluded from this defense. A final part of the Texas insanity defense is the mandate that a person's severe mental disease or defect does not include an abnormality manifested by repeated criminal or antisocial conduct. So, you can't claim an insanity defense based on a mental disease or defect as a result of a lifetime of criminal activity. How often have you made a mistake about the facts of a situation? In this screencast, we'll discuss the Texas Penal Code defense of mistake of fact. Make sure you take note though, your mistakes made in good faith might be a defense, but your assumptions aren't. The Penal Code states, it is a defense to prosecution the actor, through mistake, formed a reasonable belief about a matter of fact that negated the culpability required. So, mistake of fact is when a person violates a law due to a good faith mistake. An example is selling alcohol to a minor. Let's say the minor produced a fake driver's license to a bartender that looked legitimate and a reasonable person could have made the same mistake. In this case, the bartender might be able to offer a mistake of fact defense. Of course, if the license didn't appear legitimate, then this probably is not going to work. If the bartender hadn't asked for any proof of age at all and simply assumed the person was the legal drinking age, then there can't be a mistake of fact. Mistake of fact involves a good faith mistake, not simply an assumption. Finally, the penal code clarifies that even if the mistake of fact is valid, the actor may still be convicted of an offense as applied under the facts he or she believed existed at the time. Do you know every Texas law? Of course you don't. The next offense we'll discuss is referred to in the Texas Penal Code as mistake of law. Mistake of law occurs when the defendant does not know a law exists. Only in rare cases is it a legitimate defense and, similar to mistake of fact, it can't be based on simply a lack of knowledge. The Penal Code states, mistake of law is an affirmative defense if the actor was ignorant of the law because he or she relied upon an official written statement of the law, such as an official printed copy of statutory law, or the actor relied upon an official written interpretation of the law of a court, such as the official printed copy of a court's opinion in a case. So the common phrase is, ignorance of the law is no excuse. 
Maybe it would be better phrased as ignorance of the law is unlikely to be an excuse since a defendant wouldn't be able to claim mistake of law without it being based on their interpretation of an official written document that contained errors. Even if this defense is successful, the penal code states the actor may still be convicted of an offense as applied under the law the actor believe existed at the time. It's common knowledge that alcohol and drugs can release inhibitions and affect decision making, usually not for the better. In this screencast, we'll discuss the Texas Penal Code defense of intoxication. Many persons under arrest who are brought to jail are drunk, high, or sometimes both. This mental impairment is an issue that has to be addressed because laws typically require mental intent combined with an act to equal a crime. There are two types of intoxication recognized in the penal code, voluntary and involuntary, and there's a distinct line drawn in between them. Voluntary intoxication, for instance, going out with your friends and drinking too much is never a defense according to the penal code, but involuntary intoxication could be a defense. This might include doctor prescribed medications when you aren't reasonably made aware of the side effects, for instance, the labels aren't printed or nobody tells you, or someone drugs your drink without your knowledge. Involuntary intoxication, according to the penal code, specifically does not include things like taking medications that are known to cause intoxication and then intentionally, knowingly, recklessly, or negligently doing something, or even intentionally or knowingly taking an unknown substance from someone who is not a doctor, dentist, or other sort of healthcare professional. The Texas Penal Code states that in certain circumstances, one person may become responsible for the conduct of another person. But we have to be able to distinguish when someone is a willing participant and when they are just trying to beat the rap by saying I was forced to commit the crime by somebody else. The penal code lays out the ground rules for the he made me do it claims in the defense of duress. The defense of duress is only allowed under very specific circumstances. The penal code states it is an affirmative defense the actor engaged in the conduct due to threat of imminent death or serious bodily injury to himself or another. A key word in the statute is imminent. That means immediate. Somebody is holding a knife to your throat and telling you to commit the crime. That's imminent. If they are threatening you over the phone, it is much, much less imminent because they are not physically present to cause you the death or injury. In a misdemeanor offense only, it is an affirmative defense the actor engaged in the conduct due to force or threat of force. This compulsion exists only if the force or threat of force would render a person of reasonable firmness incapable of resisting the pressure. There are a couple of catches to both of these, however. The penal code goes on to clarify, it is not an affirmative defense under this section if the actor intentionally, knowingly, or recklessly placed themselves in a situation where he would be subject to compulsion. So if you do business with drug cartels and they force you to commit a crime, you can't use the duress defense because you put yourself in the danger of dealing with a dangerous criminal element to begin with. Finally, it is no defense a person acted solely at the command or persuasion of his or her spouse. So basically, just because your husband or wife tells you to go rob the liquor store doesn't mean you can use that as a duress defense. There has to be something else along with it, such as an imminent threat of death or an imminent threat of serious bodily injury, along with the command or persuasion to be eligible as a defense. The entrapment defense is one of my personal favorites because it's so incredibly misunderstood. It's the next Texas Penal Code defense we'll discuss. According to the Penal Code, it is a defense to prosecution the actor was encouraged or enticed by agents of the state, usually the police, to engage in an act he or she would not otherwise have committed. Would not otherwise have committed is an important distinction. The key to entrapment is the predisposition to engage in the criminal conduct and to an extent the actions of the police, which shouldn't be extraordinary. The question to be posed is, would the person have engaged in the criminal conduct anyway, even without government encouragement or enticement? For instance, you've probably gotten a speeding ticket at some point in your life. You may have even been caught in a speed trap, as many like to say, but there is an important distinction between a trap and entrapment having to do with the predisposition to commit a certain crime. For instance, how many times in your life 
have you been speeding and not been caught? How many times prior to your ticket had you been speeding on the exact same road and around the same time you got your ticket? It just so happens on that particular day, there's a police officer there running radar and he catches you. He didn't trick you into speeding. You are already doing it or predisposed to doing it. True entrapment involves crime that a person is not predisposed to do and potentially extraordinary actions of the government. For instance, Let's say you are walking down the sidewalk when a police officer on the other side of the street says, come here. You cross the street, and then he writes you a ticket for jaywalking. This would probably be considered entrapment. Were you predisposed to jaywalk? No, probably not. Was the officer's act of summoning you just to write you a ticket extraordinary? Probably so. You only jaywalked because you were following the directions of the officer, as most good law-abiding citizens would do. Age is important in criminal law. We do not consider children and younger teenagers to have the same knowledge, experience, and life lessons as adults, and legally rationalize they are therefore incapable of fully forming the mental states or intent required to commit a crime. In this screencast, we'll review what the Texas Penal Code sets forth in regards to using age as a defense. Historically speaking, under English common law, children under seven years of age could not be convicted of crimes and children between 7 and 14 only had limited responsibility for crimes. Today, age as a defense in Texas depends upon the precise age of the juvenile and the offense involved. The Texas Penal Code and the Texas Family Code set a bottom line standard by indicating no person younger than 10 years old may be charged as an adult for any criminal offense. In some cases, however, we may see fit to charge try and convict juveniles older than 10, but younger than 17 as adults. Examples may include particularly heinous crimes or when the juvenile has repeatedly demonstrated resistance or indifference to rehabilitation efforts in the juvenile system. In such an instance, the penal code sets limits on the age and offenses we can charge a juvenile with, and in all but a few cases, mandates a judge must be involved in making the decision whether or not to move them from juvenile to adult court. It's typically not automatic. First, the Texas Penal Code establishes a person younger than 15 may be prosecuted as an adult if the offense is perjury or aggravated perjury when it appears by proof the person had sufficient discretion to understand the nature and obligation of their oath. Or, a person younger than 15 may be prosecuted as an adult for a fine-only traffic offense or fine-only ordinance violation. So a juvenile that is 10 years old or older can be prosecuted for perjury or aggravated perjury or for certain fine-only offenses. Next, the Penal Code states a juvenile who is older than 14 may be prosecuted as an adult if the offense is a capital felony or a lesser included offense of a capital felony, an aggravated controlled substance felony, or any felony of the first degree as long as the juvenile court waives its jurisdiction and grants a motion to transfer the case to adult court. In other words, it's not automatic. Next, and in a similar way, the penal code states a juvenile younger than 17 and older than 10 may be charged as an adult with capital murder or murder, but again, only if the juvenile court waives jurisdiction and grants a motion to transfer the case to adult court. Finally, a juvenile who's older than 15 may be charged with any other adult criminal offense, again, as long as the juvenile court waives jurisdiction and grants a motion to transfer the case to adult court. Finally, the Penal Code states, no person may receive the death penalty if the crime was committed when they were younger than 18. Also, no person may be convicted of a C misdemeanor when younger than 10. And finally, with the exception of a juvenile curfew ordinance, a person who is at least 10 but younger than 15 is presumed incapable of committing a C misdemeanor offense other than a traffic offense or violation of an ordinance unless the prosecutor proves by a preponderance of the evidence the defendant knew the conduct was wrong.